Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Haynes Brands fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference to your speaker today, T.C. Robillard, Chief Investor Relations Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Haynes Brands Quarterly Investor Conference Call and Webcast. We are pleased to be here today to provide an update on our progress after our fourth quarter of 2019. Hopefully, everyone has had a chance to review the news release we issued earlier today. The news release, updated FAQ document, and the replay of this call can be found in the investor section of our Haynes.com website. On the call today, we may make forward-looking statements either in our prepared remarks or in the associated question and answer session. These statements are based on current expectations or beliefs and are subject to certain risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially. These risks are detailed in our various filings with the SEC and may be found on our website as well as in our news releases. The company does not undertake to update or revise any forward-looking statements which speak only to the time at which they are made. Unless otherwise noted, today's references to our consolidated financial results as well as our 2020 guidance exclude all restructuring and other action-related charges and expenses. Additional information, including a reconciliation of these and other non-GAAP performance measures to GAAP, can be found in today's press release. With me on the call today are Gerald Evans, our Chief Executive Officer, and Scott Lewis, our Chief Accounting Officer and Interim Chief Financial Officer. For today's call, Gerald and Scott will provide some brief remarks, and then we'll open it up to your questions. I will now turn the call over to Gerald. Thank you, TC. Haynes Brands delivered a solid fourth quarter with record cash flow. Overall results were once again right in line with our guidance and demonstrate that our multi-year strategy to improve our business is working. Key highlights in the quarter include operating cash flow that exceeded the high end of our guidance for both the quarter and the full year. We delivered on our commitment to bring our leverage back within our target range. We saw continued strong performances in international, consumer direct, and champion. An adjusted gross margin improved 130 basis points over prior year driven by increases in both our U.S. innerwear and U.S. activewear segments. And U.S. innerwear's operating profit and operating margin increased over prior year, with both metrics exceeding our guidance in the quarter, despite lower-than-expected revenue. We believe this is an indication that U.S. innerwear's profit has begun to stabilize. In addition to U.S. innerwear's fourth-quarter profit performance, we saw two additional developments that point to improving revenue and profit trends in 2020. First, our intimates business improved sequentially and was in line with our expectation for the quarter. The strong performance was driven by our bra business, which increased over prior year as our revitalization efforts and product innovations such as Easy Light and Dreamwire continued to gain traction. And second, while early store resets by a major retailer had a short-term impact on basic sales in the quarter, we're pleased with the longer-term potential this reset holds for our business. Within the stores that have been reset, we're gaining shelf space and we're gaining market share. Once completed, we believe this reset should have a positive impact on our basics business beginning in the second half of this year. Over the past several years, we have executed a strategy to diversify our business and position the company for increased earnings growth and shareholder returns. To accomplish this, we set five specific goals, and we've delivered on each as highlighted by our fourth quarter and full year results. First, we have diversified our revenue. International revenue now accounts for 36% of sales, up from 11% in 2013. Consumer direct revenue, which represented 30% of fourth quarter sales and 25% of full year sales, is up from 9% in 2013. And on a constant currency basis, Global Champion, excluding C9, generated more than $1.9 billion of revenue in 2019 an increase of more than $1.1 billion in just three years. Second, we've consistently delivered organic revenue growth. The fourth quarter marked our 10th consecutive quarter of constant currency growth, and we accomplished this despite challenges in our U.S. business that included a muted holiday and a $46 million headwind from exited programs. Third, 
We position the business for higher levels of profitability over the next several years by exiting unprofitable businesses and restructuring our supply chain to lower cost. We believe our supply chain restructuring initiatives have positioned U.S. Interware and the company for improving margins over the next two years. We also believe this represents an important milestone for U.S. Interware as it remains a critical driver of our strong cash flow. Fourth, we're generating higher levels of operating cash flow. In 2019, operating cash flow increased 25% over prior year to more than $800 million. This is approximately $200 million higher than our cash flow from just three years ago. And fifth, we have reduced our net debt by more than $1.1 billion in less than two years. We ended the year at 2.9 times levered on a net debt to adjusted EBITDA basis, which is a full turn lower than our peak. Now that we're back within our long-term range of two to three times, our priority for 2020 is to use our excess free cash to buy back stock. The focus of our entire organization for the past several years has been on strengthening our business to return to a model that is able to magnify sales growth into faster operating profit growth and ultimately even faster EPS growth. With a lot of heavy lifting done and our program exits behind us, we believe 2020 represents an inflection point for our company, one that reveals the underlying strength of our ongoing business and unleashes the full potential of our capital allocation model to drive accelerated shareholder returns. Turning to our 2020 guidance, through the remainder of my remarks and for comparison purposes, I'll be referencing our rebased 2019 results, which adjust for the exits of C9 at Target and our DKNY Intimates license. This will provide a clearer view of the underlying trends within our business. Using the midpoint, our 2020 guidance implies approximately 3% revenue growth. This is driven by strong performances in international, consumer direct, and champion. And while we continue to plan conservatively with respect to our U.S. interware business, we expect improved revenue trends in 2020 in both basics and intimates. Our guidance for U.S. interware assumes revenue growth ranging from down 1% to up 1% for the full year. And for the total company, we expect adjusted operating profit growth of 7% as our investment spending normalizes and cost savings from our supply chain restructuring flow through, particularly within our U.S. interware segment, where we expect operating profit to be up over prior year. With lower interest expense and lower share count, we expect adjusted earnings per share growth to accelerate to 15%. Embedded in our guidance is $200 million of share repurchases. And we expect to generate between seven and $800 million of operating cash flow. So in closing, we delivered solid performances for the quarter and the full year. And as our 2020 outlook suggests, we believe we've reached an inflection point in our business model. With our exited programs behind us and all of our capital allocation tools at our disposal, we believe we are well positioned for accelerating earnings growth and shareholder returns over the next several years. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Scott Lewis, our Chief Accounting Officer, who is serving as Interim Chief Financial Officer. Scott has held leading roles in our strong global finance organization since the company went public and is providing us with a seamless leadership transition to support our goals and strategies. Scott. Thanks, Gerald. Before I discuss our fourth quarter results, I want to highlight a supplemental document on our IR website that reflects revisions to our prior period results. These revisions primarily relate to adjustments to our income tax balances. The revisions had a minor cumulative earnings per share impact of one cent over the three-year period from 2017 to 2019. Additional information can be found in our FAQ document as well as in our 10-K. Now let me discuss the quarter. Overall, we reported solid fourth quarter results. Revenue, adjusted operating profit, and earnings per share were in line with our guidance, while cash flow from operations exceeded the high end of our range. For the quarter, sales were $1.75 billion. On a constant currency basis, sales increased slightly over prior year. I'll note that our results reflect $46 million of expected headwinds in our activewear segment from the exit of commodity programs in the mass channel, as well as the planned wind down of C9 at Target. Adjusted gross margin increased 130 basis points over last year to 41.4%, driven by higher margins in both our innerwear and activewear segments. Adjusted operating profit in the quarter 
was $263 million and included $3 million of currency headwinds as compared to last year. Our adjusted operating margin of 15% increased approximately 40 basis points over prior year as our strong gross margin performance more than offset higher distribution costs and an unexpected bad debt charge of $3 million related to a retailer bankruptcy in Australia. Both adjusted and GAAP earnings per share were 51 cents, an increase of pr over prior year of 13% and 24% respectively. In the quarter, we generated $559 million in cash flow from operations, an increase of $57 million compared to prior year. For the full year, we generated a record $803 million in cash flow from operations. With respect to the balance sheet, as compared to last year, we reduced our inventory balance by more than $150 million, and we paid down over $600 million of debt. Our leverage at the end of the quarter was 2.9 times on a net debt to adjusted EBITDA basis. This is down one full turn from our peak in the first quarter of 2018 and brings us back within our target range of two to three times. With that summary, let me take you through our fourth quarter segment performance. As compared to last year, U.S. interware sales declined 4%. However, operating profit increased 5% as our operating margin expanded 210 basis points to 24.6%. Both operating profit and margin exceeded our forecast in the quarter as the benefits from earlier price increases and lower distribution expenses more than offset higher commodity cost and lower unit volume. For the quarter, basics revenue declined 5% due to the impact from door closings and an earlier than planned disruption from store resets at a large mass retailer. While these resets are causing short-term fluctuations, we believe once completed, this should have a positive impact on our basics business beginning in the second half of this year. And with respect to our intimates business, as expected, our trends improved sequentially driven by our bra business. For the quarter, bra revenue increased slightly and operating margins improved nearly 300 basis points over last year as our revitalization efforts and new product innovations gain traction. Turning to our U.S. activewear segment, sales declined nearly 7% over last year and were slightly better than our forecast. The segment's result reflects the $46 million of expected year-over-year -year headwinds I referenced earlier. As compared to prior year, champion activewear sales, excluding C9, increased 14%. C9 revenue de declined 26%, or $26 million and sales in the remainder of our activewear segment declined approximately $30 million, which was better than our forecast. Activewear's operating margin of 15.8% declined 30 basis points over prior year. Activewear's gross margin increased in the quarter, driven by the benefits of our remixing activity, including a higher mix of champion sales. This was more than offset by higher SG&A expense, including higher distribution costs. In our international segment, Revenue increased nearly 7% and was above our forecast, driven by stronger than expected results in both our active wear and interwear businesses. On a constant currency basis, international sales increased 10% or $60 million over prior year, with mid single digit growth in interwear and 22% growth in champion. International's operating margin of 14.9% declined 130 basis points over last year as the benefits from higher sales were more than offset by short term FX transaction cost pressures, as well as the $3 million Australia bad debt expense I referenced earlier. Touching briefly on our global champion business, excluding C9, constant currency sales increased 22% over last year and were in line with our expectation. This consisted of 22% growth in both our domestic and international champion businesses. And now turning to guidance to present a more representative comparison of our ongoing business between 2020 and 2019 we provided a supplemental table on our IRO website. This table provides rebase financial information for 2019 that adjusts for the exits of C9 at Target and the DKNY Intimates license. During my guidance discussion, all year-over-year -year comparisons will reference our rebase 2019 results. I'll also point you to our press release and FAQ document for additional guidance details. However, I would like to share a few thoughts to frame our 2020 outlook. We expect solid growth with enhanced profitability, even though the first quarter is expected to see difficult comparisons. With a strong balance sheet, our capital allocation strategy is expected to drive accelerating earnings per share growth, and we've identified additional cost reduction actions 
to those we've begun last year that should generate further profit improvement in 2021 and beyond. Our 2020 guidance demonstrates accelerating growth rates as you move down the P&L. At the midpoint, our full-year guidance implies revenue growth that's approaching 3% and adjusted operating profit growth approximately 7%. With expected benefits from lower interest expense and $200 million of share repurchases planned early in the year, we expect adjusted earnings per share growth of approximately 15%. We expect to generate 700 to 800 million in cash flow from operations. After any additional capital allocation initiatives this year, we expect our leverage to decline to 2.7 times by year end. With respect to our restructuring and other actions, we expect approximately $50 million of charges in 2020. Approximately $10 million of these charges are cost related to the excess of C9 and the DKNY license. Approximately $10 million relate to our 2019 supply chain restructuring, which were previously planned. The remainder of the charges are focused on additional actions to further reduce costs, primarily within our supply chain. In isolation, we expect these additional restructuring actions to deliver approximately $40 million of incremental profit, with $30 million coming in 2021 and remaining $10 million coming in 2022. Touching on the first quarter, we expect muted revenue and operating profit growth due to transitory and timing issues in the international and U.S. interwear segments. Within U.S. interwear, we're facing headwinds from a large sock shipment in last year's first quarter as we displaced a competitor at a large value retailer. We also expect continued short-term disruption in our basics business from the previously discussed store reset at a large mass retailer. International constant currency revenue growth is expected to slow to 2% in the quarter before returning to mid-single-digit growth in the second quarter due to the timing of the Asia expansion this year compared to last year. And Air National's first quarter operating profit is expected to decline due to the increased investments to support our Asia expansion as well as short-term FX transactional cost pressures. For the rest of the year, we expect revenue and operating profit growth as we benefit from the continued momentum in our intimates business the completion of store resets in the mass channel, expanded distribution in Asia, cost savings from our supply chain restructuring, and price increases in certain international markets to offset the cost pressures from foreign exchange rates. So in closing, we delivered solid results for both the quarter and full year. We delivered on a number of initiatives to improve our business model, and as our outlook suggests, we believe we've reached an inflection point now that our program exits are behind us and we've brought back our leverage within our targeted range. We believe the combination of our strength and business model, our strong balance sheet, and all of our capital allocation tools position us for accelerating earnings growth and total shareholder returns in 2020 and beyond. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to TC. Thanks, Scott. That concludes our prepared remarks. We'll now begin taking your questions and we'll continue as time allows. I'll turn the call back over to the operator to begin the question and answer session. Operator? Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. In the interest of time, we ask that you limit yourself to one question. If you have any additional questions, you may queue back up. Our first question comes from Omar Saad with Evercore ISI. Your line is now open. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, nice, nice quarter, guys. I wanted to ask, um, for a little bit more color around the basics reset, what's happening in a kind of core basics business? I think there's it sounds like something's going on at a mass retailer. Sounds like an opportunity for shelf space, but maybe you can give us a little bit more color. What's happening there? How to expect it to kind of flow through the P and L and, and and timing of when that uh, part of the business might reaccelerate again? Thanks. Hi, Omar. It's Gerald. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. And we are pleased with the fourth quarter, our record cash flow and double digit EPS growth. And our inline guidance really speak to what we've been doing to improve our, our business model. And we really do look to 2020 as a, an inflection point for this business. And an important part of that is the underlying strength of our ongoing businesses. And a part of that is anywhere. And, and yet we did see improvement from a profitability standpoint, certainly at the end of, of uh, 2019. As we look to 2020, we do expect the, uh, the revenue to improve as we work through the store research sets in the large retailer. The large retailer started the reset um, at the end of last year in 2019, a little earlier than we had expected. And 
And as you see with resets, there's sell-off of, of exited uh, SKUs and businesses and so forth that can create some short-term interruption. But what we do see and what we like is our space is expanding, and with that space expansion, we're seeing our share expand. So the balance of the chain resets to the first part of 2020, but we expect as we get past that, that as we get to the second half, we'll pick up the tailwind of that on our innerware business and the benefit we saw from share expansion in the initial reset, along with the improving trends we're seeing out of our intimates business. On the revenue side, we expect to also then pick up the additional uh, restructure, cost restructure benefits that we implemented in 2019 to flow through the second half. So we really do expect a stabilization of, of our revenue line as we work through the balance of 2020, and we expect the operating profit to, to be up. And so we're very encouraged by that, and that's an important uh, punctuation on our strong cash flow as well when we see our, our profit growing within Interware. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jay Sol with UBS. Your line is now open. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So I, I have a two-part question. Number one is, uh, Scott, can you maybe give us a little bit of a direction on how you expect gross margin to play out for this year? And then secondly, uh, the press release mentioned something about, um, you know, identified control deficiencies um, that can, you know, that constitute a material weakness in internal control. Can you just give us an idea of, of what that means and what some of the actions you've already taken and, and say will continue to take um, over the year to, um, you know, to address that situation? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Let me. This is Gerald. Let me take the gross margin part, and I'll turn it over to Scott to talk about the revision part of the question. From a gross margin standpoint, we would expect our gro our gross margins to strengthen as we work through the year. We've got a number of um, restructure initiatives that we undertook in 2019 that will flow through in 2020 as it works its way off the balance sheet um, into the second half of the year. So you would expect that to ramp along with our revenue is is ramping in the first as we get overlap some of the headwinds in the first quarter of 2020. So, Scott, would you want to take yeah, a Sure. Back? Thanks, Gerald. And uh, good morning, and, and thanks for your question. Uh, for the revision, just to put some context around this item, the impact of the revision adjustments uh, had a minor cumulative earnings per share impact uh, to us of one cent over the three-year period of 2017 to 2019. Um, and I think it's important to understand as we look forward um, this, this tax issue uh, we will not impact our tax rate as we move forward. We uh, continue to expect the tax rate uh, in the mid-teens. Uh, we, we discovered the issue as we were preparing our, our year-end financial statements this year, uh, and the issue uh, revolves around and relates to uh, the tax treatment of, of intercompany uh, inventory transactions and ultimately impacted uh, our, our prior period tax balances. Now, when we, uh, this, we identified this, we've... Uh, uh, we, 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 had, we quantified it, and we revised prior period financial statements to correct for these errors. And we also addressed it for other immaterial uh, out-of-period items at the same time. And you mentioned uh, the controls, and from a controls perspective, uh, we, we already made some, some process improvements in this area. We actually, uh, one of the process improvements that we were working through helped identify this issue. Um, we ultimately did conclude that this was a material weakness. Uh, we have and will continue to refine and enhance controls in this area. Uh, we're taking this very seriously. Uh, and we intend to imp implement uh, in these enhancements to the course over the, over the course of 2020. Thank you. Our next question comes from Susan Anderson with B. Riley SBR. Your line is now open. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe quantify a bit um, how much the innerware business is impacted next year by C9, DKMY, and then the door closers, and then also how you're thinking about the growth of champion sales in 2020 as we go throughout the year, both domestically and internationally, and the impacts of the Asia distribution expansion. Thanks. Um, sure. Let me look at, let me start with the, the C9 portion of your question. It's in the rebase numbers that we looked at on the, the basics or the innerware side of things. It was approximately $42 million of sales that was in Interware Basics. We have recovered the vast majority of that, but it's a bit masked in the, the rebase numbers because as we planned for 2020, we also assumed uh, there would be the impact of door closures of about 35 to $40 million, so they, they offset in the numbers. But I think you should, should take um, solace in knowing that we have planned conservatively on the Interware side, and as we begin to hear about door closures in other places, we have those covered in our our guidance as we look toward 2020. So we feel we've appropriately planned um, uh, the innerware business from the standpoint of being conservative yet 
and, and know the, the phasing of that business as we also see the, the revenue and, and um, profitability ramp throughout the year. So we feel good about that business and where it's positioned and appropriately planned from a conservative standpoint. From the, from the Asia champion, just kind of how the year maybe unfolds for, for growth. Yeah, from the champion business, first of all, let me just say um, last year champion had a, another, we finished really well in the fourth quarter. Champion was up uh, 22% uh, in the fourth quarter again, and it was 22% domestically and 22% internationally. And just to give you a sense of how big that business has become, it's about $460 million globally in the quarter, and it finished up 40% uh, for the year. So as we look at 2020, uh, we expect to, to surpass the $2 billion mark. We expect to an, another year of double-digit growth for Champion. We are overlapping some very large comps in the first part of the year, so we've, we've planned a, a mid-to-high a mid high single-digit growth rate for Champion in the first half of the year and a, 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 a double-digit growth in the second half of the year, low double-digit growth in the second half of the year. Uh, so we are continue to be very bullish on Champion, and it's it's, it's ability to continue to grow. We're seeing strong POS. We saw strong POS through the holiday periods around the world as well, and we are well on our way, as to, obviously, to reach our $2 billion goal in 2020, two years early, and we uh, believe we can add the next billion in the next four to five years. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ike Burchow with Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Gerald, two, two questions. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the FAQ, there's uh, some commentary about f finding the, a new C9 partner and something, you know, new revenue stream in the second half, but it sounds like it should be minimal. I just, any more color on that would be, would be really helpful. It's interesting that you guys are able to, uh, to get a partner for the brand. Um, and then secondarily, uh, there was a big department store that talked about, um, you know, a three-year store, uh, store closing program. I'm just curious if you could let us know how that impacts your multi-year view of, of Interware, how tied you know to those 125 doors you are. Just just anything there over the next three years would be helpful as well. Sure. Let me start like with the C9 uh, part of the question. Uh, C9 has continued to perform well right through the balance of 2019. Uh, really exceeded our expectations through the balance of of 2019. And and it's clear to us that there's a, a strong consumer uh, base out there that's very loyal to that brand. We are in the final uh, stages of discussions with a new partner, and uh, we expect to launch that program, initial program, in the second half of this year. Relatively small to start with, and uh, as, as you noted, it is in our guidance at this point in time, but it has the potential to, to ramp uh, nicely over time if, as, as we get the program going. So um, we'll provide some more specifics on that in the coming months, but uh, we're very pleased to have the, the opportunity to, to keep that, that brand in the market and satisfy those consumers. From the standpoint of uh, the department store information, um, the, the vast majority of the business we do um, in Macy's is it on, is it on Macy's.com and in their largest stores, um, and that's where, the, where all of our really growth comes from in that account. As noted in the announcement, the stores targeted for closure are, are a small part of their total business, and while the closure list has not yet been fully communicated, we believe the doors targeted for closure not, do not represent a material part of our business. In regards to 2020, as I noted in my earlier comments, we had planned the possibility of, of door, additional door closures in the market, and we feel that we have um, the, the initial 30 covered in our guidance, and as the list develops, we'll continue to assess that, but we feel we've got it covered in our guidance for 2020. I think, once again, it reinforces what we've been focused on for a while, is, is the consumer's um, choice of where they shop and their shopping habits continues to evolve, and we've been focusing over the last few years on diversifying our revenue base and, and where we sell, and particularly developing our, our consumer direct piece of the business, which is, in, as we noted in our comments, was 25% of our business um, in, in the last year. And so Macy's.com is part of that, as well as Pure Plays and as well as our own site. So we'll continue to diversify where we sell to meet the, the shifting needs of the consumer. So we feel good about where we have Interware going and that we'll continue. To, and Interware is one of our fastest growing consumer direct businesses. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jim Duffy with Stiefel. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning, guys. Nice job with the cash flows and the balance sheet. Um, so this gives you some newfound balance sheet flexibility into 2020, looking at the implied cash flow outlook for 20, uh, well in excess of the dividend obligation and the $200 million in planned repurchases. Does the balance go to debt reduction, or, or could you see repurchases beyond that $200 million? 
Hi, Jim. It's Gerald, uh, and, and thanks for that. Uh, we have definitely focused on delevering, as you know, and we're very proud to have achieved that goal. It gives us a lot of flexibility, and uh, we are very disciplined in our capital allocation approach. We have noted that our intent is to use the uh, $200 million of excess cash to, to repurchase shares. Um, that will allow us to continue to delever. Um, we'll assess as we work through the year, but certainly getting solidly back in our range gives us significant amount of flexibility in, in exercising our full capital allocation. So we'll work through the year, but we are very pleased to be back within our range. Thank you. Our next question comes from Heather Balski with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, first, it, with regards to your champion guidance uh, for next year, can you just talk about um, the different components in terms of active wear and international and how you're thinking about the growth there? And then also in terms of your cash flow guidance, if you could just help with a little more color, how do we think about some of the moving pieces, especially working capital? Thanks. Sure. Let me take the first half of that, and I'll let uh, Scott take the second half of that. From the standpoint of of a champion, we expect to continue to see the balance growth really between international and the and the domestic piece. It, it is growing nicely. Actually, the um, the uh, the innerwear piece of our champion is growing at a very rapid rate as well, and is helping drive that total total strong growth that we're seeing around the world. So we expect both the active wear and innerwear elements of our champion business to grow. We we as we've said before, we've been very successful in the men's business. We still have room to grow as we develop um, a greater share in the women's business as well as the kids' business, and, and outerwear represents a new category for us as well. So we see um, multiple areas that we can continue to expand the business as well as continue to grow, of course, where we, we have distribution today. Scott. Excellent. I appreciate your question, and good morning. Uh, we, are, we are very proud of the uh, record level of cash flow that we had in 2019. The, the team did a fantastic job this year. We and a, a, a good improvement in our cash cycle days. We feel this takes us to a new level uh, from, uh, and, re and reinforces our ability to generate cash flows. Our, our operating cash flows in 19, uh, we accomplished that through a strong gap, net income, and working capital management. And as you think about the 2020 cash flow levels, you know, our guidance is uh, the 700 to $800 million. You can, you can arrive at that in, in a couple of ways. Um, in, and one way is looking at our 2020 gap net income. Uh, the midpoint is uh, around $585 million. Uh, if you add back our non-cash items like depreciation and amortization and stock compensation, which uh, is typically around $180 to $190 million, uh, you land right in the midpoint within that guidance range. Um, another way of thinking about it is if you look at our 2019 cash flow level of $803 million, our 2020 gap net income is uh, at the midpoint is around $20 million lower um, then 19, as, as we talked about the program exits, and just using the same working capital assumption that we had in 19, which is actually flat um, uh, for that year, uh, we you arrive right within that guidance range again. So we feel like this is a prudent way of looking at cash flows in 2020, and uh, we feel like, again, we're in a really good position to drive uh, strong cash flows uh, in 2020 and beyond, and this is helping with, with strong returns. And, uh, again, like, like Gerald mentioned earlier, this gives us opportunities to continue to lever for share repurchases and really drive shareholder return. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tiffany Kaniga with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking our questions. Would you please help us understand a bit better what drove the bra revenue increase in the fourth quarter, and if you anticipate that carrying forward as part of the flattish rebased full-year guidance for innerwear despite retailer door closures? Or put another way, would you quantify what level of bra growth is baked into your 2020 plans? Sure. From the standpoint of what drove that growth, it was we certainly have been on working on a revitalization uh, program for, for some time now within the Intimates business, and one of our key elements of our bra expansion was innovation, and we've seen both our DreamWire and our Easy Light innovations perform very well, and as you may recall, we paired that with um, both um, online or digital support as well as uh, TV support in the case of the Bally Easy Light. So we saw nice traction from the standpoint of those launches, and we've seen it ramp, and uh, we expect it will continue to ramp, particularly as we get through the into the, the later quarters of the year. So we are expecting um, actually growth out of our intimates business um, next year in, in the guidance that we gave. Thank you. Our next question comes from Paul LaJoyce with City. Your line is now open. 
Hey, thanks, guys. Um, it seems like you took some price on the innerware side that, that helped margins in that segment. Can you just maybe talk about how your retail partners have adjusted their pricing, what sort of sell-throughs you, you know, that they are seeing, um, just basically what's the consumer reception to the, the price increases? And also, I just wanted to make sure on the international side, you, you mentioned some bad debt. Uh, that negatively hurt your profits this past quarter. Was that a one-time thing, or do you expect that any more of that to continue in uh, F20? Thanks. Sure. From the pricing question, our, we've implemented our pricing in, in Interware really last uh, February, so February of 2019. You may recall at the time we, we were pricing because uh, commodities had peaked ahead of that pricing, and we put that pricing in place. So it's been an place a long time. We've generally seen that the pricing in the market is, is settled out around it and so forth. Uh, what we're seeing now, though, is as the pricing continues to lap itself, that the, the peak of the commodities is passed, and we're actually seeing margin improvement as the commodity costs begin to ramp down and, and the pricing overlaps that. So we're, we're seeing that now. As we look to interware in the second half of 2020, we get the added benefit of the supply chain restructurings that we had executed in 2019. We'll work their way off the balance sheet and give us added improvement in our, in our operating margins and profit within Interware in particular. Um, from the standpoint of the, the international bad debt, that was a bankruptcy in Australia, and we would expect that to be an, an, an individual event, not something that's ongoing there. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Swartz with Morningstar. Your line is now open. Yes, thanks for taking my question. Uh, can you give us an update on the new distribution agreements for Champion in South Korea and China? And also, do you think that the health crisis in China will affect store openings this year? Thanks. Sure. From the standpoint of the distribution agreements, uh, we have two new partners, one in Korea and one in China, as, as you noted. From the standpoint of, the, of their um, how they will flow, they are planned for later in the year. So at this point in time, we do not see the, the current issue uh, having an impact on, on that business. You may recall that our Chinese commercial business is, is fairly small today, less than 1%. Uh, from the standpoint of that overall issue, we're taking it very seriously. It's an, it's an evolving um, issue. We have uh, stopped our own travel of, of our, our employees as well as we, we watch it very carefully from the standpoint of our vendors. And we will keep that travel stopped until uh, we see that the illness is, is, is stopped or ceased. From the standpoint of our business, we don't see it having any um, meaningful impact on our business at this time, and we certainly are working on contingency plans, either from a sourcing standpoint or a business standpoint. But back to your original question, we feel good about those distributors, and they'll have more of a, a, a second-half impact. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Kernan with Cowan. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Jim, you, you mentioned and called out Champion hitting your targets you know, earlier than you had anticipated, and you mentioned a billion dollars in incremental top line that you thought uh, you, the brand could generate. Can you walk us through how you're getting there and just the bridge between uh, distribution growth in North America and international and how, to, how we should think about that billion dollars uh, in revenue opportunity you're talking to? Sure. As we began to look at it from the standpoint of, of the next billion, uh, we see it as continued to be a global expansion. And in many ways, the, some of the categories I, I touched on earlier, important elements of that, the drive from just from simply being predominantly a, a, a men's brand to one that becomes a, a cross genders and includes a, a kids business as well. It would obviously include an important ramping in markets like Asia, where we think there's tremendous opportunity, further expansion in our Europe markets and within the, the U.S. market, for example, where we have pretty solid distribution, that's where you would, you would expect certainly us to build a bigger business across women and kids as well. And then there are categories out there that we really don't play in, such as outerwear, and we also are in the midst of partnering with a company on, on some initial shoe offerings as well. So we, we see lots of avenues to grow, and we would see it sort of, sort of being consistent growth over time. Thank you. Our next question comes from Carla Casello with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Hi. Um, you talked about both the shelf space gains and losses, and I think you gave us some nice clarity on the intimates um, in Korea and, South and China. But can you just say the timing of – was that, was that the only major change in shelf space this year, or was there something else that was embedded in one of the other categories that I missed? 
Um, no, I think for this demo shelf space, we're fairly stable from a shelf space. And when I speak to you about that in the shelf space, I'm speaking more on the innerware side of things. Shelf space is, is fairly stable. We do see the, the solidification of the, the basic space within the, the mass channels we referred to earlier, but we feel good about our, our shelf space and our, our innovations behind it. Of course, on the activewear side and Champion in particular, we're continuing to drive distribution expansion in the U.S. as well as, as globally. So we have a nice, nice trend there as well. Thank you. That concludes our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to T.C. Robillard for any closing remarks. We'd like to thank everyone for attending our call today, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. Have Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.